Welcome to this uh, installment of uh, Deeper Seminar Series. My name is Sergey Rachenko. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am the Academic Director of Deeper, and today I'm very honored to uh, have an old friend come and visit from afar, uh, Fritz Bartel, who will talk about uh, his new book. Where's the book? Where's the book? Did you bring the book? I, well, I have one copy. I gave it away already to someone. So. Okay, <laughs> that makes me feel very bad. Yes. <laughs> the book available at all, all places you can buy books. It's available. It's available on Amazon. I checked. The book has been published by Harvard University Press. Um, the Triumph of Broken Promises, The End of the Cold War, and the Rise of Neoliberalism. And Fritz, you know, if I, I think, when was it when we first met? We met at Yale a number of years ago, uh, where um, you co-organized uh, a conference, uh, which I thought was extremely interesting because it brought together historians and kind of political scientists, and it tried to bridge the gap that exists at the moment between the Cold War as a subject of historical study and after the Cold War. The reason that the gap needs to be bridged is because after the Cold War, certainly at the time we were having this conference, still such a new thing. Uh, and it wasn't, people weren't really thinking about, about that period in historical terms, but it seems that as we move on increasingly, it's possible to do that. It's possible to talk about it. And I, of course, that conference, um, was co-organized uh, with uh, uh, Nuno Monteiro, who has since passed away, but uh, you two co-authored co uh, um, or co-edited a volume where I also participated uh, or had a little contribution as well, uh, called uh, Before and After the Wall, right? I think the after the fall. Yeah. World politics and, and the end of the Cold War. World politics in the in the end of the Cold War. So very, uh, uh, you know, and this is where this is where we met a number of years ago uh, at the Yale. But uh, where also Fritz used to be there at the Yale at the International what's the program called International Security Pro Security Pro uh, studies. studies right. Uh, but since then he is he has moved on. He's now in Texas uh, at College Station, uh, where he is a part of the Bush School of Government at uh, Texas A&M University. Uh, a fun place. We just discussed my recollections today about visiting College stations, College Station some years ago. Uh, and apart from, of course, seeing uh, Fritz there, there's another thing that really draws, draws historians to College Station, and that is the site of the personal library of President Bush, the previous one, not, not the younger, the older one, not the younger one. Um, so, and that is just in the way of introduction, Fritz. Welcome to Bologna. Uh, this is, you know, of course, Fritz's first time. He, he, he told me the first time he, he's visiting Bologna. So uh, it's uh, you know it's it's great to have him here, and uh, I look forward to your presentation, uh, which I think will go for how long did you say for about thirty thirty five minutes? Thirty to thirty five minutes, and then we'll switch to questions. Uh, yeah, welcome. <laughs> Is it okay if I stand? I feel like I'll... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Sergey. Um, and thank you all for coming. I, I know you have uh, many other things, probably assignments you could be doing and, and things like that. So I will try to make this uh, worth your while. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A. And let's make sure I'm my audible online and everything. Okay. Um, and please do feel free to share your Bologna suggestions with me. I have about a, more than a half day tomorrow. So um, looking forward to seeing more of the city. Uh, so this is my first book, uh, The Triumph of Broken Promises, The End of the Cold War and the Rise of Neoliberalism. Uh, as the subtitle suggests, it tries to connect these two rather large topics, uh, which you may have some sense of already, but you probably haven't seen them connected kind of in a single uh, book. And so that's uh, really what this book tries to set out to do. And I'll spend just about a half hour um, telling you kind of how I came at the project, because I think it's probably how many readers will also come to the project, uh, and then laying out some of the arguments and, and major findings for you. Um, 
So the project began with, um, you know, my mental images of, of days like this, November 9th, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, of, of, you know, one of the most famous moments of the late 20th century. Um, and it, it, it really kind of started in my mind when I learned this fact that I did not know, that when the Berlin Wall came down, the Eastern Bloc was $90 billion in debt to capitalist banks and Western governments. Now, this debt made didn't make any sense to me. I couldn't figure out why communists would borrow money from capitalists. I couldn't figure out why capitalists would borrow money from communists. Uh, didn't really kind of accord with everything I thought I knew, I knew about either one of them. Um, but the more I looked into it, it became clear to me that uh, this fact and, and it's kind of the history of how this debt came to be actually had a lot to say about some of the biggest questions uh, really in the history of the late 20th century, the, the global history of the late 20th century. So what, what are those questions? First and foremost, um, perhaps the biggest and, and not a new question by any stretch of the imagination, why did the Cold War end? Of course, this is something that scholars, including Professor Redchenko and many others have long debated, uh, but they haven't really done so with any kind of connection to this question of sovereign debt and, and really more broadly, the economic causes of the end of the Cold War have, have been studied in a way, but I didn't think that they had been kind of given their full, um, the full story hadn't yet been told. Relatedly to that question, why did the Cold War end relatively peacefully? It's an, another thing that has stumped scholars uh, for a very long time. In your own, in your classes, you uh, are probably familiar with the idea that great power rivalry usually isn't supposed to end with one side just kind of walking away, retreating and giving up. Uh, so why holders of imperial and authoritarian power willingly and peacefully gave it up? Uh, is kind of what makes, for me, the end of the Cold War stand out and, and really cries out for explanation. From there, what role did Western actors play in the end of the Cold War? And this is something that, generally speaking, historians have said there really wasn't much of a Western role. Or in fact, or really the only people who did say it were those who kind of, from the so-called Reagan Victory School, who said that it was Ronald Reagan kind of spending a bunch of money and bankrupting the Soviet Union and, and the Soviet Union just collapsing. So since historians had discounted that idea generally, we were left with a sense that Western actors really didn't play much of a role in the end of the Cold War. And I thought, as I'll explain here uh, in this talk, that Western actors did in fact play a substantial role in ending the Cold War. <clears throat> And then finally, when I, the question that I didn't realize I'd be trying to answer when I set out for this project with, with this project, but what connection did all of these events we generally think of as the end of the Cold War, these geopolitical, largely geopolitical uh, events, what connection did they have to what we, in political economy, we usually now call the rise of neoliberalism? And I'll get into a little bit more about what that means if you've never heard that term, but we could generally say the uh, the move kind of across the world in the late 20th century towards more market-based uh, policies in uh, the economic realm. So rather than the state being heavily uh, intervening and controlling the market, the state reorganizing how it controls markets to allow markets to play a larger role in determining economic and social outcomes uh, within societies. So that, so I think Kind of the, one of the premises of the book, or one of the aspirations of the book is to try to tie that large story to the story of days like this, where, where a rather significant geopolitical uh, event unfolded. So historians have really tried to answer all of these questions in a certain kind of way. I don't think they've been answered uh, together in a, in a single book and, and not through something like uh, sovereign debt. And so as I set out to do all this research, uh, really what dawned on me was that the first thing I needed to do was actually offer a new definition of what the Cold War in fact was. And so I'll give that to you first. So I think, and if you read this book, you'd hear a lot of uh, attempts to make you think that the Cold War began as a race between uh, capitalist and communist governments to expand the social contracts that prevailed in their societies. 
Okay, so to basically offer their people more economic and social security and to pro provide rising living standards uh, to their people. But it ended because of the economic crises of the 1970s that I'll talk a little bit about here in a moment. It ended as a competition to discipline those social contracts, which side could in fact impose various forms of economic discipline on their populations without their people reacting, kind of uh, causing or, or uh, carrying out a significant destabilizing social backlash. In other words, to make it as simple as possible, it began as a race to make promises, but it ended as a race to break promises. It started very kind of fundamentally different with a different type of politics, the politics of making promises that as I call it in the book, but it ended with the politics of breaking promises, which side could could break the, the previous promises that they had made to their people. And with this new definition of the Cold War, then I, I lay out an argument in the book that kind of unfolds in a number of steps. So first of all, global capital and energy markets. So how much money is sloshing around in the world and then who controls energy resources. These two things exploded in size and importance in the 1970s. So today we hear a lot about how, of course, whether it's sanctions or sovereign debt or the energy weapon in Russia or, or what OPEC, OPEC Plus is doing, uh, right? finance and energy define our world in 2022. I think that you could tell a story of that that goes much further back than the 1970s, but the modern version of that, the contemporary version of that really goes back to the 1970s when these two markets exploded in size and importance. And these markets in turn pressured governments around the world, in both the capitalist and the communist world, to impose economic discipline on their populations. And I'll talk more about what economic discipline means, but it could be just uh, kind of flat out fiscal austerity. It might mean uh, disciplining trade unions. It might mean uh, free, kind of liberalizing trade and capital flows. Uh, but Broadly speaking, the variety of policies that were pursued all kind of trended in this direction of economic discipline. And therefore, governments that could impose discipline on their people were the ones that survived. And governments that could not were the ones that uh, collapsed. You might already see this. It's not the most pleasant book. If you are looking for a Christmas gift for your, uh, your family, this may not be the one that provides the, the happiest of endings. But it, it will hopefully uh, give you some sort of insight about the late 20th century. So why, did the, why was the West able to do this? Well, the, the contention of the book is that electoral democracy and this neoliberal ideology, this embrace of market-oriented policies and the, and the way that that was justified, gave Western states the political and ideological tools to impose this discipline. Communist states in the Eastern Bloc, of course, had no recourse to either electoral democratic legitimacy, nor to a ideology that would embrace anything close to free markets. They did try to move towards markets, as I'll say a little bit about, but they didn't have recourse to either of these two things. And so they sought, about, they sought to democratize themselves and reform their ideology in the 1980s as a means of imposing economic discipline. And this goes from perestroika in the Soviet Union to various uh, reform projects in the Eastern Bloc. And so the end of the Cold War then is a tri the triumph of broken promises, as I say, because it was this, this pressure to impose discipline, this pressure to break promises that ultimately drove the events that we now think of as the end of the Cold War, like the fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9th. So this is an argument I pursue in the book in 10 chapters, in over two parts. I won't go into them in any significant detail, but the first section I go from the, fir the first oil crisis of 1973-1974 through Mikhail Gorbachev's rise in the Soviet Union in 1985. And the basic point of this section is to kind of lay out how the Western world turned from a kind of Keynesian paradigm, post-war paradigm of making promises or social democracy in, in Western, particularly Western European states, towards a more neoliberal direction 
where they were imposing economic discipline on their population. So this is a picture from Margaret Thatcher's uh, uh, defeat of the miner strike in Great Britain in 1984. And she very clearly here able to impose a kind of discipline on the, at least a segment of the British population that at the same time, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, a very similar thing is happening, but we think of it in very different ways. This is La Fuenza in Poland, also the, the leader of a union that also doubles as a political movement, right? But the Polish government is essentially trying to defeat a union as well for both political and economic reasons. And eventually it is able to, in this case, to defeat the union by imposing martial law, but in, all, in doing so, it loses whatever political legitimacy it, it had left, right? So disciplinary processes, basically Thatcher is able to, get, to maintain her legitimacy as she goes about this because she's popular, she's elected through uh, a democratic election that people perceive to be fair and uh, free, and she uses this neoliberal ideology. These tools are not available to the Polish government uh, on the other side of the Iron Curtain as they tackle a very similar type of challenge. So in the part one of the book, basically the West conquers this challenge and the East does not. This in turn leads to part two, where I, I go into the actual events that we normally think of as the end of the Cold War. So the arms race between the two superpowers, the rise of Perestroika and Glasnost in the Soviet Union, and then the revolutions of 1989, the Polish round table, the Hungarian round table, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the reunification of Germany in 1989 to 1990. And I, I kind of specify, and I'll talk a little bit about how finance and energy played substantial roles in all of those events. So a another word uh, before I turn to breaking promises about this, this politics of making promises that started the Cold War. Uh, this is, I think, kind of the most famous moment in this politics of making promises. This is the so-called kitchen debate in Moscow between, at the time, U.S. Vice President uh, Richard Nixon and Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, where they're not debating how, who has the, the, the biggest weapons, who has the most weapons, who can, it's a very different debate than, unfortunately, we're having in 2022. And they're actually debating who can make better dishwashers who can provide more dishwashers to their people, who can build their people more houses, who can provide their people with a better life, promise their people a better life, and then actually deliver on that promise. And at this moment, Khrushchev and many other people, including in the West, believed that the Soviet Union was the one that was actually, over the long term, destined to succeed. So he, very, he gives this very uh, famous press conference where he says to Nixon, uh, by 1970, we will, we will pass you by, we'll, we'll wave at you, and we'll invite you to come along behind us, right? Because uh, he's so, he's kind of bristling with this confidence that the future belonged to state socialism and eventually communism, which would arrive in the Soviet Union, he said, by 1980. Uh, Nixon, of course, responds. He says, well, he points at the camera and he says, we're broadcasting this in color television back in the United States, don't you know? Like, that's, that's what we're doing for our people. You can see my face in color in the US. Right? So, so all of this is, is a debate after the kind of immediate Cold War sets in, which is very security, security oriented. It turns into a debate over lifestyle and who can promise their people a better life and then deliver on that promise. What neither side could have known at that time, but what became true by the 1970s certainly, was that this was this, this whole set of, this form of politics was dependent on a unique global period in economic history, a unique period of global economic growth that had never come before and has not reappeared since. So this is a, a, a chart that, that shows you economic growth in the USSR, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, the USA, and the world in basically the early 20th century, the the third quarter of the 20th century, 1950 to 1973, and 73 to 2001. And what you can see is that in every area of the world, uh, certainly every area of the global north, as we would call it, and then the world at large, what happened from 1950 to 1973 was, was exceptional. And economists to this day are still trying to figure out, and they debate kind of why that, that exceptional period went away, what, what made it happen in the first place, whether or not we can recapture it. 
But so far, we basically have not been able to do that. And so this, this, this form of politics of making promises of, of kind of continuously providing your people with a better life was in fact based on a truly unique period of global economic growth. And that period of growth starts to slow down in both blocks, both East and West, right around 1970, for a series of reasons uh, that are some specific to each block, some just kind of true for the, the world at large, and, and they aren't, we don't need to go into them here. But what comes in, in its place is, or what, what immediately arrives is this first oil crisis of 1973 and 74. And in the place of economic growth, it creates two enormous new pools of wealth around the world that, that countries can access as a way of continuing to make promises to their people, energy, wealth, and global capital markets. So this is the real price of oil. Some of you may know this, this graph, and if, if you were to extend it beyond 2000, you know, we've certainly gone back up and down here. But as you can see from 1950 to the early 1970s, it was in fact slightly declining in real terms. And then it, the, the crisis in 1973-74 was a fourfold increase, which was partially kind of orchestrated by OPEC uh, at the time. Uh, the rest of the 1970s continues. And then in 1979, there's another substantive, the second oil crisis, which produces yet another uh, basically uh, doubling of the oil, uh, real oil price. Uh, in 1979, 1980. So if you're an oil producer like the Soviet Union, this arrives in your world as a windfall, a massive windfall that you did not see coming, but you are very, very happy to accept, right? Because it starts to paper over all kinds of economic problems that you might have. If you are not an oil producer, but in fact, an oil consumer, you now need to find new ways to pay for the oil that you were using before, but is now four times as expensive. And the unregulated Global capital markets, which start to develop in the 1970s, so-called euro markets, explode as well in size and importance, precisely because of the so-called petro petrodollar recycling process, where all the money that the oil producers are making, they have to put somewhere, so they put it back in cap Western banks. Those Western banks then lend that money out to countries around the world, and this petrodollar recycling process continues continues for a while. And the question is, when will it end? And what caused it to end? Because that's going to be decisive. So this produces what I call in the book, the privatization of the Cold War. What does that mean? Well, it's, it means that the race to make promises now depended on finance and energy. If nation states maintained access to energy or capital markets, they could continue this politics of making promises. But if they ever lost access, then they would have to turn to policies uh, of economic discipline, and they would have to break promises. And diplomacy in this world, so what do you do if you're a state actor in this, in this world, consisted of granting or denying other states access to finance and energy. Okay, so this is a type of diplomacy where all you, every, many countries are using in 2022, right? Putin's trying to cut off, has cut off energy to Western Europe. We've sanctioned him in various ways. This is the type of diplomacy that emerged in the 1970s. Uh, and for a while in the 1970s, it was about granting or in increasing your access to finance and energy. So this is what I call the battle for the Eastern Bloc, where the West, Western nations and the Soviet Union try to control the states of Eastern of the Eastern Bloc, Eastern Europe, East Central Europe, through finance and energy. On the left is the cover of uh, Euro Money magazine. It's kind of it was like the leading financial. Uh, leading publication of, the, of these euro markets of unregulated capitalism in the 1970s. And surprisingly, in January 1977, it has the socialist block on its cover to uh, summarize the like every year it picked the biggest story of the previous year. And the biggest story in 1976 on in unregulated capitalism was state socialism because state socialists were borrowing so so much money. On the on the right is the annual subsidy that, uh, that the Soviet Union gave to its allies in oil and natural gas. So it's, it kept its, the kind of price that it charged all of these countries much lower than the world price. And, that, and if you calculate that subsidy on a rough basis, because we don't have exact numbers, but you can see that every year, billions and billions of dollars it was granting to its allies uh, as, a, as a way to try to keep uh, their political allegiance. Um, 
and keep them under under the under Moscow's control. So this is a process that can continue so long as the United States is not uh, imposing discipline on its own people, as, as long as it's not uh, trying to restrict the money supply within the United States because the US dollar is the basis for this Euro dollar market, right? As Paul Volcker, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve at the time said, it's the, you know, the US dollar is the US currency, but it's the world's money because everyone around the world uses it. And so as soon as the United States kind of turns to discipline, everyone else around the world is gonna to have to do the same. And that's precisely what happened in the late 1970s through what is now called the Volcker shock. So as you may have read in stories about our current inflation, inflation was the dominant problem, socioeconomic challenge for the United States in the 1970s. And this man, Paul Volcker, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, eventually decides in 1979 and 1980, 1981, 82, to defeat, the, defeat inflation within the United States by basically sending the United States into a, a massive, the largest recession of the post-war period. He's, this is uh, the federal funds rate, the kind of benchmark interest rate. And you can see that this period 79 to 84 is one of, of truly historic uh, proportions. And even our own time, we would only be getting kind of back to this, you know, two and a half, three percent And that's what we're talking about now. So you can imagine if it was getting to 15, 16, 19%, uh, it's truly uh, historic levels. And this Volcker shock is usually uh, said to be kind of the turning point in the global history of neoliberalism, this, this turn towards markets around the world. And so I think it's probably the right time to, to tell you. So what do I mean by neoliberalism? What, is it, what does that mean to me? So this is how I define it in the book. A political ideology that uses markets to increase the free flow of goods and capital across state borders, increase inequality within nation states, Kind of hard to believe in 2022, but at, at the time there were many, many people who actually believed that increasing inequality was the way to uh, return nations to economic growth and limit the state's role in the provision of economic and social security for its citizens. That's broadly what neoliberalism is, and there. And then the question is, how exactly is it? Uh, can it possibly be achieved? Right? It attempts to shift from the state to the market, responsibility for social and economic outcomes. And the question then is how exactly do US officials pull this off? Well, they start by demonizing, of course, the government, right? It, the government is no longer promising you something and delivering something for you, but instead, as Ronald Reagan said in his first inaugural address, government is not the solution to our problem, it is the problem, right? Margaret Thatcher, in October, another famous speech in October 1980. It's not the state that creates a healthy society. Instead, it's a great nation. A great nation was the product of countless acts of personal self-confidence and self-reliance. In the book, I call this turn, this rhetorical turn towards demonizing the state and embracing the market. I call it the look no hands doctrine because it's a, it's a, uh, I'm glad that phrase resonates with some of you because some people don't understand exactly what I mean. What do I mean by the look no hands doctrine? Basically, government officials are able to tell their people as, as economic outcomes become very, very bad, look, our hands aren't on the, aren't on the steering wheel. We're not in control of it, right? It's, it's markets that are producing these outcomes, not the state. If you can reshift and reorient your entire public discussion to say that Markets should be determining outcomes in the state, shouldn't be because the state is a problem rather than a solution. Then you've kind of abdicated responsibility for those outcomes, which if you're trying to break promises to people is a very, very effective way to do so. So this comes from this man named Charles Schultz, uh, who is actually Jimmy Carter's chief economist. And he's talking about uh, how Volcker moved towards what's called monetarism, the idea that rather than him, at, so now when you hear the Federal Reserve raise interest rates, they actually make a decision to raise the rate by three quarters of a percentage point or something. Monetarism would instead say, we're just going to target the total amount of money supply and let the interest rate go where it may, right? And that's how you get 
the interest rates to go all the way up here and then way back down and all the way back up. And very, very quick. And Schultz says this, the move to monetarism was in the broadest sense a political move, not an economic move. In theory, the Fed could have kept on raising the bejesus, very nice American English word, I think, out of the interest, out of interest rates, but that's not what he could do politically. The beautiful thing about this new policy was that as interest rates kept going up, the Fed could say, we're not raising rates, we're only targeting the money supply. This way they could raise rates and nobody could blame them. In other words, everyone could say, look, no hands. This is a policy, this is a type of politics to say, look, no hands, that is, is as you can probably imagine, not available to the states of the Eastern Bloc, right? By the very design of their states, by the very nature of their ideology, their hands were very proudly in every aspect of their societies. That's, that's, what they, that's what they wanted. That's the promise that they had made to their people. And yet, as I try to bring out in the book, they are not immune to this type of challenge and this type of thinking. Right? So they try over the course of the 1980s to in fact move to what you might think of as a look no hands policy. It's not, it's not surprising to see Ronald Reagan say that the government is not the solution, it's the problem. But it was a little bit more surprising to see something like this in the archives in Moscow. This is Gosplan, the State Planning Commission, uh, the, one of the leading economists within it. So not a, any, any kind of reformer within the Soviet Union, writing to Mikhail Gorbachev in January 1984 before he becomes uh, the general secretary of the party. Socialism is not collective philanthropy. The view is becoming more and more common among economists, and he means only Soviet economists that the free provision of goods weakens incentives to work. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan could not have stated their own beliefs any better, right? Or for instance, a few, a few years later, Gorbachev in 1988, we must rid ourselves once and for all of the no of notions that, of socialism as, as something that levels society, as some sort of minimum, as a minimum of, of material benefits, a minimum of justice, a minimum of democracy. So I can't, I'm not gonna make the full case here, but in the book, I, I make the case that perestroika is in fact an ideology of, discipline, of economic discipline, of trying to discipline the Soviet social contract as it uh, had arisen throughout the post-war period. And ultimately this is a, something that of course Gorbachev uh, fails in, right? and he's not able to carry out his reform pro program. And it's a significant part of why uh, the Soviet Union collapses at that time. But if so, so, uh, so the Soviet Union and so socialist states in general are not able to do this, that's going to be a problem for them in the 1980s because uh, capital and energy markets, which had been so favorable to them in the 1970s, began to turn exactly the other way in the 1980s. So uh, the vice closes, as I say here. Volcker's raising of interest rates to that level not only had effects in the United States, it had effects around the world, including in the communist bloc. It's the exact same thing that's happening right now as the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, right? There's all kinds of countries around the world, particularly those that have borrowed a lot of money that are now facing significant payment problems. So this is the con called the con communist bloc current account balance, basically tracks how much money is flowing in or out of the communist bloc as a whole on a yearly basis. Okay, and anything below zero, so the current account deficit means they're importing capital on an, like a net annual basis. And anything above zero means they're basically repaying the world. And from 1982 onwards, you can see until the very, very end, they, because global capital flows start to go towards the United States and away from the communist world, they on net are starting to pay back all of these loans that they've uh, taken out in the 1970s. This happens at the exact same time that Soviet energy exports, that other kind of key uh, crutch that they had, have also started to plateau. So after going up throughout the 1970s, it leveled off the 19, early 1980s and never again increases. Okay, so they're basically left to their own devices. And this is precisely what Gorbachev, again, an idealist through and through, but also a person who's very well aware of Soviet national interests and is trying to redefine what Soviet national interest means. This is what he tells them in November, 1980, 
1986, uh, November 1986, when he repeals the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine. So the, the, this was the unofficial doctrine that the Soviet Union would intervene to protect socialism and all of its uh, allies, right? If they ever became too deviant or something, the Soviet Union would actually invade that country as a way of protecting socialism. 1986, he tells them, November 1986, and I, uh, many people have different views on when exactly this happened, but I, I believe it happened here. When he makes the case on a purely kind of economic basis, he tells them, we lived on credit, referring to the 1970s. And the problem with living on credit is that sooner or later, one must pay for it. Now you could question whether, why kind of already socialists and communists are buying into the logic of, of a kind of capitalist system, right? But they certainly are by this point. You have to pay for it. No one, and, and therefore, he says, and this would have been the, the sentence that has the utmost importance to everyone in the room who, who's listening to this. No one will claim or can claim a special role in the socialist community. Okay, so the Soviet Union is no longer claiming, he's telling them, uh, this special role because it does not want the responsibility of trying to get these countries out of, uh, out of their, their debt and economic issue. So this is basically a declaration to the socialist bloc that you have to go deal with your problems on your own. And this, to make a, a slightly longer story short, or slightly shorter, uh, leads to the Polish Roundtable of 1989, the first step in the collapse of, co of communist governments that year. Uh, and in our histories of the Polish Roundtable, we, we really currently don't have a role for debt or Western actors, uh, or it's really not conceived of as economically driven uh, in most instances. And that's and yet this is precisely uh, what we see. So this is from the archives of the International Monetary Fund, February 2nd, 1989, just as the round table is about to open. And this is after three or four years of the IMF kind of being, uh, putting significant pressure on Polish officials. And this is a, an IMF official reporting back on a conversation he's had with a Polish official. He says, the Polish official says that the main immediate purpose of the round table talks is to offer a political concession so as to facilitate the authorities' economic plans. Kind of direct evidence that historians rarely find in the archives to make it so plain that, right, there's this trade going on between political and economic concession. So again, it remains to be seen whether he's right. But basically, uh, he was right, with some small caveats being that the opening of the round table and the, the round table process itself doesn't lead to a kind of managed democracy as the Pol Polish communists thought, but instead produces the first non-communist government uh, since, the, since the start of the Cold War in Poland. Solidarity uh, as a political force is brought into the government and the first uh, solidarity prime minister, a man named Tadeusz Mazowiecki, immediately moves to implementing what becomes known as shock therapy and uh, an austerity program, very much with the approval of the IMF. And right? so you start to see how political change was driven by these broader uh, and long running economic forces and how Western actors, not necessarily for any good reason, but West Western actors are very much involved. So I'll just end with where we began with the fall of the Berlin Wall. As this crisis is unfolding in 1989 in Poland and Hungary, East Germany is itself dealing with its own sovereign debt problems. It's very, very reluctant. The, the, the communist leadership is very reluctant to impose austerity on its own people. And it's, instead, it sees an alternative way to try to resolve its financial problems by opening uh, access for East Germans to leave the country, by, in a sense, opening the Berlin Wall itself. And this is from October 13th, 1989. And it's the leading uh, financial diplomat, we could say, of East Germany, writing to a man named Egon Krinz, who would become the uh, East German leader very, very shortly, two days after this. And essentially what Krenz has asked him to do is evaluate proposals for ransoming the, the opening of the Berlin Wall in exchange for on the order of 10 billion Deutschmarks. 
And he basically, in this document, he tells him this, this sounds like uh, a good idea. It's of course fraught with enormous risk, but we don't have a lot of options. And so Krentz sends this man named Schalk to uh, West Germany to begin these negotiations. And over the next month, the two sides don't get all that close to an agreement, but as the wall opens on November 9th, uh, East Germany and West Germany are in negotiations over how they would open the wall in exchange for significant financial relief. So the East German government is essentially ransoming the opening of the Berlin Wall uh, prior to its accidental fall on November 9th, 1989. So we're left with this, the triumph of broken promises, as I said at the beginning, as is in the title of the book. I don't think we should have any question or any reluctance to say that the West won the Cold War, which is something we often debate, historians debate whether or not that's the appropriate way to think about the end of the Cold War. I don't think we should have a problem stating that the West did, but we should be very clear about why the West won. The West won because it was able to impose economic discipline on its own people and justify that discipline in, in, through the kind of use of neoliberal ideology. And this was a kind of type of politics that was not available to the socialist bloc. So the end of the Cold War and the rise of neoliberalism emerge out of the same economic forces uh, that come out of the 1970s and they lead to these divergent political uh, outcomes in East and West. And so I'll just leave you with a couple of implications for our discussion and then very much look forward to your questions. I think in some ways we can say uh, that Gorbachev was unexceptional and that that's a good thing. Uh, the more we think of the end of great power conflicts as reliant on the exceptional influence of a particular person, the less confident we should be that future great power competitions will end peacefully, right? Because in my country, anyway, the last exceptional political figure we produced was Donald Trump. And I don't uh, hold much hope that he would uh, end a great power comp competition, exceptional in a out of the norm sense, not in a, uh, an exceptionally good type of sense. So Gorbachev is, is in many ways exceptional, but he's also a product of forces, kind of structural forces that are leading him to a, a new definition of Soviet national interest. And that type, that national interest was one that in fact, a number of other Soviet leaders shared, perhaps not to his degree, but they shared it uh, in some ways nonetheless. Second, Western actors did indeed play a decisive role in ending the Cold War. And we can then debate whether or not that role was, was in any way good, right? If you're trading austerity programs for the, the emergence of electoral democracy, that seems to be a highly ambiguous way to think about uh, whether or not the West's role was good. Neoliberalism was a response to a crisis in industrial society, okay? Both East and West, there was a kind of general crisis of industrial society in the 1970s, and that produced neoliberalism uh, in, in both East and West. So concepts we use in our histories of Western neoliberalism can be productively applied to the history of state socialism as well. Uh, that's perhaps more of an academic point that, that scholars can debate. But I think this last one is, is important for, for all of us. Future great power competition is just as likely to be determined by how great powers manage their relationships uh, within, with their own people, within their countries, than with each other, right? So US-China uh, competition over the long term seems to me to be just as much determined by how the two governments manage legitimize their rule, uh, per either make promises or break promises to their people, but how they're able to do that over many decades will, much, will be much more likely to determine which side ultimately prevails if we wanna think of it as a competition than what they do to each other. And so, so uh, our, the arms competition, uh, proxy wars and every, everything else in the, in the first Cold War, in the traditional Cold War were not completely unimportant but they were far from the decisive factor in actually producing the dramatic changes that we saw uh, in the 1980s. Instead, it was definitely much more related to how the, the two sides were able to relate to their own people. So I, I think I've gone on long enough. I look forward to your questions uh, and thanks very much for your attention. Oh.
Uh, thanks very much. This was great. Um, thank you for this uh, far-ranging presentation. Um, we have a number of people who are online. Just a reminder to those who are online, you can ask questions. Um, there is a function for asking questions and we're Q&A. Okay, so you, you're, I, I will keep an eye on, on that um, function in case people online ask a question. Of course, the rest of you here will uh, join. Uh, just in the way of opening the discussion, I was convinced by this. And you, in many ways, I, I was going in that direction myself as I was researching the Cold War and the Soviet Union and the Cold War, of course, it's the subject of a book that, uh, 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 as you know, Fritz, is, is coming out shortly. And although my focus was different, what I did find was just how much the economic question determined Soviet approach to Eastern Europe at the end of the Cold War, with Gorbachev literally saying, okay, if we intervene, what next? Who, how are we going to pay for these people, you know, for those Eastern Europeans? We don't have the money to do that. Uh, you could argue that the same reluctance to intervene directly already was there even before, i.e. at the time of the Solidarity Crisis, which is one of the reasons the Soviets were uh, not so keen to intervene. And in fact, Andropov famously or infamously said that our quota of interventions has been exhausted. Mm -hmm. When they debated this, the Polish crisis in the in, in the Soviet leadership, um, it was clear that they, what they really were worried about was American sanctions against the Soviet economy at a time when the Soviet economy was already in, in, in very difficult straits. And of course, uh, at that time as well, they were hoping that by providing uh, the Poles with subsidies, which people like uh, Honecker, for example, deeply resented because he also was facing lots of problems. They could, the Poles, of course, then would then resell the oil and gas or whatever that they got from the Soviets and, and, and hopefully keep their population somehow happy and subdued. But as you know, the lack of democratic legitimacy made it extremely difficult to buy off the population in Poland. We could see that in the Solidarity Crisis. So this is very important. Uh, and the argument is very important because we have seen so much discussion by biographers of Gorbachev, by various people who studied the Soviet Union, to the effect that, yes, Gorbachev was exceptional because he, he was averse to the use of force. He would not use force. Therefore, uh, this is where we need to look for answers to uh, the collapse of the Soviet empire. Simply, Gorbachev didn't want to do that. When in reality, when you actually follow the money, it turns out he just didn't have the money to keep the, keep up the empire, uh, which is, I think uh, you're exactly right, is, is uh, you know, makes for far more plausible explanation. Here's my question, you know, and then we'll open the question more widely. Uh, it's very interesting that you draw a parallel between the Soviet Soviet society and the socialist society uh, in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe. Um, both were obviously industrial societies and both in some ways faced uh, some similar challenges, but there's a, a noticeable difference. And that is already in the late 1960s, the Soviets understood that their economy was not performing as much as they would have expected. Um, there were studies prepared, for example, by uh, Andropov that were, you know, that he sent a memo to uh, Brezhnev back in 1968, in which he outlined all of those problems that would, that came to plague the Soviet economy, including failure to keep up with in R and D mm -hmm. um, uh, with the United States, the Americans were investing so much more in education, so much more in R and D that agriculture was not efficient, et cetera, et cetera. So basically the Soviet economy already in the 1960s was not performing. It was very clear that it was not going in the right direction. In 1966, there was an extensive Politburo meeting in which the uh, problems of Soviet economy were debated for hours on end. And it, when you reread this stuff, you realize, my God, these people fully understood what kind of terrible situation the Soviet Union was in. And this is 1966, i.e. a long time, 20 years really before Gorbachev's perestroika. Then what happened, as you rightly noted, is suddenly, hey, there's, an, you know, there's a, crisis, you know, a crisis in the Middle East, the oil price goes up, gas price also goes up, and the Soviet Union is able to 
maintain its standard of living by earning cash and 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 then basically importing stuff from the west which it did with reasonable success until the 1980s until the collapse in the price of oil so again the economic factor is up to uh, up you know up front and 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 really major factor here but where i would like to challenge you on is this this question of parallels i.e all the con the 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 economies of the of the Eastern Bloc, the rickety you know economies that were already falling apart, simply just could not compare to the economic performance in terms of the labor efficiency, in terms of the R and D, et cetera, of the Western Bloc. So this is where I think a major difference is, and it was not really, uh, it was already there in the nineteen sixties, and not necessarily uh, in the late nineteen seventies, early eighties. What do you think of that? Yeah. Uh I think the problems are certainly understood to be long, uh, kind of long-term and structural in the Soviet Union at an earlier state than they stage than they are in the West. Uh, and I think, but I, th I, I guess I think the, the the two sets take on a kind of different um, valence, a different type of uh, debate in the two sides. So if if in the Soviet Union it is or in the is in the Eastern Bloc, it is really a crisis of producing economic growth. Uh, how do you how do you continue to produce economic growth at the levels that you had previously and at levels that would match the West? I think the West understands its crisis more to be as one of governability and how do you manage crises? Uh, because uh, if anything, the West in the 1970s was understood. It, it, it seemed obvious to everyone that it was just prone to both economic crisis because of the oil shocks and because of kind of the inflation uh, and monetary confusion, which seemed to reign at every uh, stage. And there, and all of these crises seemed to produce what people called a crisis of governability in the West. Uh, basically that Western governments would not be able to manage the demands, expectations, uh, the uh, fight for resources between different sections of their societies precisely because they were democracies. Um, so even if the West maybe is uh, more confident in its long-term prospects for growth, though I think even that is becomes questionable by the late 70s because the emergence of something like supply-side economics in the United States is all about how do we re reconstitute the economic growth machine that we, did, we had before the 19, let's say, into the 1960s. Uh, so even if they're a little bit more confident about their prospects for growth, they seem far less confident about their ability to govern their own societies and to govern it, govern them in a way that will maintain the legitimacy of their of their peoples. I open the first chapter uh, with the uh, two a Soviet and East German official driving through the streets of Moscow. The Soviet official has just turned down the East German request for more uh, energy, and he's trying to kind of make his comrade feel better and so he says well at least our problems aren't as bad as the west <coughs> because we have planning we can plan years into the future and the west can't even plan three months ahead of itself right and in 1976 that's viewed as a strength uh not just by communists themselves but also by people in the west the idea that you could plan your future and come anywhere close to attaining it uh was was believed to be an enormous asset in terms of which side was doing better. And, and by a decade later, of course, it's completely the opposite. No one wants to do planning. Everyone wants to embrace markets, including uh, not pre-market, regulated markets, but certainly a greater market sphere in the Soviet Union itself. Um, and I think that just has to it kind of speaks to these not identical, but parallel types of crises that are emerging in the two sides. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I'll, I'll look forward to discussing this. <laughs> I'm sure. This is, Not this the is end super of the interesting. Story. Exactly. Uh, right. So uh, we, let's say we've got a, a, a little time for questions. Uh, when? Uh, who, okay. Who wants to? Okay. Who wants to go first? Yeah. Um, you know, we had a. So state your name. And, and hi, I'm Maeve. Thank I, you so much for your presentation. Thanks for being here. Um, so. I have two questions. Um, 
And they're the two things that I struggled most to latch onto because they're the two biggest paradigm shifts in my view from what you're, how you're explaining the Cold War. Okay. And the first is the, the intense focus on the domestic audiences versus the international sphere. And I wonder if you maybe, if you strategically chose like a later time period where you felt like maybe the 60s were more, more, more ripe with U.S. interventionism or how you're framing the U.S. involvement in Latin America, for example. Um, it sounds like maybe that's just not being given that much attention as um, driving factors, but then why waste time? Like why waste time and money getting involved in Latin America if it's really just a domestic policy game? Um, and then, um, well, actually, you know what? I'll leave it at that for now so that other people have time. Thank you. Take a couple. Yeah, okay, I'll try to remind you. So we have, we have a question from Maeve about the nature right. of war, yeah. domestic versus international. We've got, uh, I think, Ro 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 Roxy. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Roxy. I'm from the US, right? Okay. <laughs> um, it's from like right outside Washington. So same area. Well, not same area. Same country though. <laughs> um, general, general. General, general yeah. area. So you said about the um, so like hands-off policy, right? Do you think that there's anybody who's specifically in the Cold War that should not have gotten the ability to have hands off because there were all these great leaders in very p powerful political positions, both on the West and the East, who somewhat either helped or destroyed what their country ended in. And I think that some of those leaders, I mean, there's a hard way of law, but like, don't you think some of them shouldn't have had the power to say, sorry, it's not on me. So that was it. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Daniel I'm from the UK. Uh, thanks so much for coming here today. Um, I was wondering if it feels like your focus on discipline deviates from how most uh, people have narrated like the history of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. or at least how neoliberalism like packages itself as an ideology grounded in freedom, or at least like freedom from uh, like coercive <clears throat> regulation and like uh, nationalization. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that reframing of it has ramifications for how we understand the post-Cold War uh, narrative of neoliberalism or its kind of diagnosed decline, at least in ideological appeal in the last like 10 years or so. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to go in order. So uh, I guess my claim here is kind of what's analytically important to understanding the outcomes. And my my suggestion at the end, my hope for if if great if the U.S. and Chinese governments or the U.S. and Chinese populations could understand that it was the domestic course of their policy that determined the outcome, they would be less prone to intervene abroad. And so I don't I mean I don't think the intervention in Latin America did anything to increase U.S. security, but they did they they took place because. American leaders were able to convince people that it that the Cold War really was a geopolitical contest of global scale where all regions mattered, right? And and you couldn't just make the claim, Gorbachev begins to try by the 19, late 1980s, that you don't need to be waging this contest on a global scale to determine which way of life, which mode of governance is better. Um, and so I think like those would be very important ways or reasons, uh, or things to include in a general history of the Cold War itself, right? Um, but if you're trying to rank the reasons the Cold War ended, I don't think it had very significant influence. And there, and and if you're then thinking as a policy student or as a policymaker, that should tell you something about what's ultimately important right and um and then and and i hope if it, if this achieves anything it just re it gets people to feel comfortable with committing to the idea that if you just focus on your own domestic situation which is essentially not complete with what george kennan was trying to say but he was ready he was reframing it as a contest of where at one day, one point, the Soviet Union's own contradictions would bring itself to a, to a collapse, right? It wasn't going to be uh, 
what the United States necessarily did to the Soviet Union. It was going to just buy time for those contradictions to, to take hold. The United States lost track of that over time, and Kennan became a very substantial critic of U.S. Cold War policy precisely for, on those grounds, I think. So, so my attempt here is just to hopefully get people to, to be comfortable with that idea that, that great power competition is a competition just as much domestic as it is, as it is foreign. Uh, which leader should have had more, or if I could have them have more hands on, on the, uh, I mean, I, I don't think there's, it's hard to do better than Mikhail Gorbachev as a, uh, as a reformer with, um, you know, the best of intentions who, I uh, although he, I guess, believed in like disciplinary ideas, as I've framed them here was very much about retaining uh, at least early on, and I guess all the way through the end of the Soviet Union, socialism as a as a force in the world, right? And but but one that was reformed in significant ways. And uh, whether or not that project could have succeeded, is it completely contingent that he failed? I mean, these are enormous debates. But I think you know, if you could change history and grant him a little bit more control and and a little bit more of a hands on role perhaps just slightly more decisiveness uh at various points that would probably have produced some uh, better outcomes for the world um yeah to your question i i think the discipline versus freedom framings of neoliberalism goes to just what is it as a rhetorical or ideological framework and what is it tr trying to accomplish in practice and i think we should ask ourselves, how does an ideal, if, if you accept that it is an ideological framework that has persisted for four decades globally, uh, and yet it's about disciplining people, how does it kind of get away with that? Like, what, how does it justify that and continue to get enough people to buy into its logic to persist? Because it shouldn't be popular, right? Everyone in this story through the 1970s would have thought that something like neoliberalism, or certainly anything like breaking promises, was was should be impossible um but it, it persists and it remains popular or it became popular and remains popular i think precisely because of these appeals to freedom uh the idea that you are a better um a better governor of yourself i guess than than the state could be for you is retains a very significant um is a, is a kind of powerful appeal that you can make to people. And yes, it's breaking down a little bit, but I don't, but I think it's persistence. The so-called de death of neoliberalism has been declared many, many times, and yet it continues to exist precisely because it's, it's rhetorical appeal and it's ideological appeal. And the fact that uh, for, I think, very, very deep reasons, governments have not been able to recapture the kind of performance that they had in this first 30 years of the post-World War II period. That idea that, that you are a better kind of uh, controller of your own life than the government is retains a lot of uh, power for people. Thank you, though. <clears throat> That's a, a fine way to start the discussion. Uh, just a reminder to people online that you can post your questions in the, um, in the Q and A. Uh, write them in the Q&A and I should be able to see them. I'll ask them on your behalf. Um, okay, further further question from, from the audience. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you. Um, I'm Lila. I was wondering if you could elaborate on what the tactics that neoliberals either did use or wanted to use to increase inequality. Ah. Um, well, uh, let me, I just, just end it or say the story I end the book with is Margaret Thatcher's chief advisor, uh, a man named John Hoskins, who writes her a memo in, uh, early 1980 with lots of different things in it. But he says, the main thing we have to convince the British people is to give up on their traditional British hang up that a few people making a lot of money would be a bad thing. As soon as we can convince people that that's, that that's no problem. In fact, that that's 
like the key to re renewing prosperity and renewing growth, the better things will be. A lot of he said, a lot of good things will start to happen. And so, I mean, they're still the, trying to convince them. Still, yeah, <laughs> right. It's still it's still there. It's still very much alive, right? But in the in the United States, I mean, it goes the trickle down trickle down economics, right? It's it's both. It's you start at the top. You give the job creators, as they're called, the tax breaks and the the right incentives. And supposedly they're going to unleash a way, economic growth like we've never seen before, and it is it's playing out exactly the same rationale in the, in the UK right now, um, and it it did in various forms in the United States over the last forty years. So, I guess reframing wealth certainly not as something that you inherit, and certainly not as something that you uh, it would be a kind of structural deficiency to producing growth or progress or justice, but rather as, right, just kind of a reframing of incentives so that allowing people to make money allows them to pursue their own self-interest, which will in turn create all kinds of good things, which was, which was Ronald Reagan's um, kind of sales pitch to the American people. Um, it doesn't turn out that way at all. So the United States in particular uh, renews its economic growth basically by making itself as uh, amenable to foreign capital as possible. And capital starts to flow into the country at rates that no one ever thought possible, but still kind of continue to sustain the United States to today. So the job creators aren't job creators. They're, they get their asset holders and they get wealthy off of this. And the regular people, the the 99%, the other people get instead enormous access to debt fueled consumption that they did that they wouldn't have otherwise had. So in the United States, this takes the form of largely uh, mortgages and credit cards. And this, these are things that have started to spread elsewhere, right? But if you promise people essentially uh, limitless or ever growing consumption, regardless of how they achieve that consumption, that goes hand in hand with allowing the job creators or the one percent to have to retain much more of their wealth uh, and the whole package kind of is put together as one that through relaunching personal initiative will relaunch economic growth and that's that's i guess i don't know if that's a tactic the tactical question but that's a little bit more about how they how they did it sorry i answered that without going we were going to collect some but I don't write in. No, okay. So, so uh, for further questions, ready in the back of the room. We've got we've got a couple of questions. Thank you. Hello, uh, this is Adam Taylor. Uh, I was interested by your first implication that you listed, which was that um, Gorbachev you characterized him as um, unexceptional. And just thinking about the war in Ukraine today, and I think on in some ways you could characterize both leaders, Zelensky and Putin, as sort of exceptional leaders. And so the implication that it was a good thing that he was unexceptional, I was wondering if you could sort of maybe elaborate on what you'd who or who you'd characterize as exceptional versus unexceptional and uh, or how you would define that, I guess, and whether it is the case that it's always good to have um, unexceptional leaders in that case. Hmm. Should I go or no, wait for one more? Okay. Let's get another one. Oh, maybe. Yes, there we go. All right. Now I'm from. Uh, um, uh, I can hear you without. Yeah. You. yeah. <laughs> online, they may not be able to. Uh, yeah, you, they won't be able to hear online, though. So it's probably a good idea to is it? just speak into the mic. Okay. Well, it... That's her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. My name is Evan. I'm from Michigan. <laughs> so I'll, I'll repeat it or something. Yeah, okay. We'll repeat, yeah, we'll repeat it. We'll repeat yeah. it. Yeah. It's a little bit very apologetic. Your fourth point on uh, great powers being uh, primarily about how great power like people at home was very interesting to me. I've never been on this in this context. Mm. Um, my first reaction to that was, uh oh, because last summer there was a poll that 43% of Americans think that we'll be in civil war in the next 10 years. 
How do you think the U.S. and China and Russia domestically are positioned for a great power conflict now compared to towards the end of? Yeah, it's an wow. interesting set. Um, so exceptional versus unexceptional. I mean, basically, it. I think it's impossible to kind of say up front, right? If Putin was was betting on a unexceptional, by his understanding of what that would mean, Ukrainian leader who would fold immediately, right? And it was an exceptional Ukrainian leader. And I, but I, I think maybe others will come along and say that Zelensky is in in fact like the embodiment of of Ukrainian nationalism and. Uh, so, the, so basically, exceptional or unexceptional is automatically kind of a retrospective, or uh, at least a, a term of commentary about the people that uh, that under consideration that say more about the the kind of person making the claim. So, in this case, it says something about my argument, right? Um, than it does about the the leader themselves, because it's always by what standard. Um, so, I think. In my case, I was simply making the claim that, as Sergei was talking about, so many people say that without an exceptional Soviet leader in Gorbachev, you, the end of the Cold War is unimaginable. To me, that makes imagining the end of great power competition in the nuclear era unimaginable. Because how do you get to, the, how do you produce that outcome? unless you just happen to have an exceptional person get to the top of a of the soviet party state right and then decide that he wants to tear the whole thing apart um that seems um, if you were running an experiment that wouldn't happen again so uh i guess the claim would be that as international relations scholars we should hope that leaders eventually uh, maintain a certain kind of rationality. And if they are acting rationally, then uh, that will produce a better outcome. And the question for someone like Gorbachev is that it was always understood to be irrational what he was doing. Why would he ever give up the Soviet Union's empire? That didn't make any kind of sense. But if you if you kind of redefine the terms of the rationality, I think it, it does make kind of a kind of sense. But as far as kind of whether or not leaders in general should be exceptional or not, um, that's a that's a difficult one to answer. I'd have to I'll think about that a, a lot more. But thank you for asking it. Uh, the second question, yeah, I think it's it's very important, and that's kind of even more why I, I think we should think of great power competition in domestic terms because none of the three are particularly well positioned at the moment to think about things geopolitically, I would say, rather than domestically first. Um, which, is, which is best positioned? I guess I would still uh, take the United States because of its, I, th I think electoral democracies and liberal democracies over the long term uh, remain better, not just because they, they remain legitimate in the eyes of their people, but because they're the most flexible systems over the long term. They can adapt to change over the long term the best. And so uh, both in Russia and China, well, not, not in Russia at the present moment, but certainly over the last decade, there have been many commentators who have said, you know, the future is China's. And China certainly wants to make the claim that the future is China's. But, but international terms and the terms of the global economy are bound to change over a many decade type of conflict, right? You're not going to have, in the, so in the Cold War's case, you went from it being an industrial competition to a post-industrial competition who could move beyond heavy industry the best. I don't think we can yet envision kind of what the exact transition will be if, if you're thinking in US China terms, but we we should think that there will be kind of a, a fundamental transition in terms of the basis of the legitimacy of both sides and who can adapt their countries to, to kind of uh, 
meet the challenges of that new era, I guess I would still take a liberal democracy. But that, as you say, depends on people believing that they uh, live in one and that they're <laughs> that they're willing to retain their trust in it. And so, yeah, I, I, the, truly, that's that is the number one issue facing the United States right now. I I, I fully believe. Not that I'm telling anything you probably don't already believe as well, but I'll I'll just I'll I'll just add to this, although it's not my book talk. Um <laughs> but but it is interesting. I mean it's remarkable to compare what is happening in Russia today and the late Soviet Union. Um uh, there was an expectation of almost a meltdown of Russian economy after the invaded Ukraine sanctions were imposed, but somehow they managed to pull it together. And although thousands of, well, not thousands, hundreds of foreign companies fled Russia, um, the shelves are still full, more or less. Yeah, things are not going greatly, but there's not a meltdown like in the late Soviet Union, which is interesting because obviously it seems that today with all the atrocities that Russia is committing and the hideous repressions mechanism, Russia is actually more resilient in many ways than the Soviet Union ever proved to be. And that is, you remember, in the late 80s, early 90s, Soviet Union Russia were not under sanctions in the same sort of way, right? Mm -hmm. So it is mm -hmm. it is kind of interesting to compare and contrast. Uh, this is a purpose of nothing, but I do have a question for you. But one mm -hmm. of the things that you did not mention in your analysis, but perhaps it comes out in the book, which I'm really anxious now to buy, uh, is the question of is the question of China and well, okay, let's mm -hmm. let's set China aside, but North Korea. North Korea is an interesting mm -hmm. one. Here we have a country that was also basically trying to do what you know other socialist bloc countries were trying to do in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, after the Korean War, was actually doing pretty well compared mm -hmm. to South Korea. Um, where things really changed with what with, with, was with Park Chung-hee, obviously uh, launching a very Japan-like model of economic growth in the 1970s. And then North Korea was falling hopelessly behind by 1988, certainly by Seoul Olympics, it becomes clear, absolutely clear that they are losing. I mean, the, it's it's long been clear. But the interesting thing is they the is the government was able to climb down, shut the borders and say, we'll rather starve, but we're not going to change our political system. Mm -hmm. So so why you know what prevented the Hungarians or Hanukkah or you know or Yaroselsky or somebody like that from doing that North Korea. I'm not endorsing by the way the North <laughs> Korean experiment. Yeah. I'm just saying that it's remarkable. You still have a remarkable difference. Is it culture? You know, is it the proximity to Western Europe? What explains this difference? Yeah, I mean it's kind of how my story relates to North Northeast Asia in general is a one that I'd like to explore further, but I, I do think kind of as a first way of answering this, um, Eric Honecker, for instance, often tells the East German uh, Politburo, and he's not thinking of North Korea, but it, for him, the reference point would be Romania. He says, we cannot take the Romanian way, which would be severe austerity, um, because we have the however, however he would phrase it, the imperialist West Germans right next door who are kind of uh, because of West German TV and everything are able to project their lifestyle into our borders. Um, and then of course they, uh, their border, I, I think at the end of the day, it does come down to the fact that their border is just much longer too. If you think of East German Hungarian, uh, border, you know, all the way down, there's much more, if you had actually turned to state repression, uh, I think that would be a, just a practically much more difficult problem to achieve. But lastly, the I think the idea that these governments retained any kind of legitimacy that did not derive from their material, the material benefits they were providing their populations, I think that was long gone. And so uh, all of them knew, except Ceausescu in Romania, that if they had tried to do this in any significant way, uh, they would have had a violent, you know, violence would have been around the corner and that was not something without Soviet pressure behind, standing behind them that they were willing to to carry out. Um, so I, yeah, it's it's a question that I think I, I, we need to focus on much more. How did, why is China a completely different type of way than what you talked about? Why is North Korea different? But um, I do think, that the proximity to, to the West, 
Western Europe and uh, and what that meant ideologically was a big a big part of it. All right, thanks. So we've got we've got time for just one question. Anybody has one question? No, if not, I'll tell you an anecdote as a survivor of the Cold War. So my my personal my personal conviction about why the Cold War ended has to do with toilet paper. Do you know what kind of toilet paper we had in the Soviet Union? Have you ever come across Soviet toilet paper? No. No? Okay, anybody any, anybody knows? I, I have to I have to bring it one of these days. I, I, I have plenty back in, 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 in the UK. I should just you know carry it. And, <laughs> but basically uh, uh, we well for a long time we didn't have any toilet paper and we just you know tear up newspapers into little square pieces, little square pieces like that and then put them there. Uh, and then a toilet paper appeared. It was little square pieces like that. It's not wasn't a roll. And I swear you could use it for anything you want, but not for its immediate uh, intended purpose. intended purpose. Yes, because it it was it was very strange. It did not it it did not um, take in water. Hmm. Did not. It was it 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 it, had, it was covered with something that was anti. It was kind of re repelling the uh, repelling um, um, any you know wet substance. Anyway, so uh, I, I have to tell you. Yes, I have to tell you. So my my first encounter with Western toilet paper certainly convinced me of the of the superiority of the Western system. Uh, right, for others, it was supermarkets. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So on this, on this um, uh, hopeful note, um, if, thank you so much once more for coming all the way from Texas. We're certainly glad to see you here in Bologna. And would you please join me in welcoming again, Fritz Bartel. Thank you. So we, we Thanks so much, So how do you still have so much of it? Oh, or I'll tell you the story why I have so much. So uh, a few years ago, I was in Sacramento. Uh -huh. Wait, wait, wait. Are you still talking a 